Hey guys and welcome back or if you're new here, hi, my name's Georgia and on my platforms here on the internet I talk about true crime and history. Today I've got a historical topic to talk about that's been requested more times than I can possibly count over the years. But this is a really hard hitting topic and one with so many sort of different branches and rabbit holes fall down that I've never really known where to begin, how to tell this story. But we're going to give it our best shot today, we're talking about the British home children. In an overview, in 1869, Scottish evangelical Christian Annie McPherson pioneered a child migration scheme, under which more than 100,000 poor and orphan children from all over the UK were sent over to the British colonies, so Australia, Canada, New Zealand and South Africa. But today we're mostly focusing on Canada. The aim was to provide these orphan children with homes and alleviate labour shortages, it was great for everyone. But despite the apparent philanthropic efforts of the pioneers behind this, providing these orphan children with homes and families, many of them would of course go on to suffer unimaginable abuse at the hands of their new families. And then it was later discovered that some of the children were never orphans at all, they were just children ripped away from their loving families for the sake of capitalism, for the sake of labour. I suppose the timeline of this tragic tale starts many centuries ago, with the precursor to the home children thought to have begun in 1618, when 100 English children were sent to alleviate labour shortages in the Virginia colony, which would later become one of the original 13 states of the USA. This was thought to be the earliest recorded instance of child migration, but this does continue over the next couple of centuries. During the 18th century, so the 1700s, large numbers of children, particularly Scottish children, are forced to migrate to the Americas to provide labour. Exploitation of children for labour is something that has been so prevalent throughout all of history. Children have no autonomy, they have these tiny hands which makes them able to squeeze into spaces adults can't. They're more nimble, they have no responsibilities preventing them from working. Children are easily controlled, people have always known this, but even centuries ago there were many people aware that this wasn't an ethical practice. Many people disagreed with what was happening. In 1757, a civil action suit was brought against merchants and magistrates in Aberdeen, leading to the discontinuation of this practice, for a little bit at least. But then we come to the 1800s, where in London in 1830, a Captain Edward Pelham Brenton of the Royal Navy comes together with a bunch of wealthy philanthropists and the British government to form the Children's Friends Society for the Prevention of Juvenile Vagrancy. The society's aim was to reclaim and provide for vagrant children found in the streets without any means of substance except by begging or thieving. Now you've got to bear in mind that in London in the 1800s there was great juxtaposition. In this city you could come across wealth beyond your wildest imagination, people flaunting it at every single opportunity. You could also come across the poorest of the poor, with many areas of the city left in poverty with nobody having a single penny to their names. I mean this was a time in which it's thought that people without homes and hard up would pay two penny a night to lodging houses to sleep draped over a rope that had been suspended across the room at chest height. So you literally had a rope across here and people would just lean across it and sleep. People couldn't even afford to have a place to lay their heads, they had a rope. And London wasn't the only city experiencing this kind of dichotomy, it was widespread. But instead of trying to uplift the poor areas, to inject money into them, to actively help the children on the streets and the areas in which they lived, the rich just decided to send them abroad, out of sight, out of mind. In 1832, the first group of children are sent to South Africa and Australia, and later in August 1833, 230 children were shipped to Toronto and New Brunswick in Canada. Of course there was still condemnation by some, but this was put forward by the wealthy as this great philanthropic thing, helping children by providing them with work and a better life abroad. At this time though, it was fairly small time, only handfuls of children here and there being sent abroad. And then there's a massive cholera outbreak of 1866, which is followed by a number of bad harvests and then a recession. After that point, the government seemed to care less about exploiting children and everyone's suddenly on board about sending all these children abroad to help with the labour shortages. The main pioneers of the child migration during this time were three women called Annie McPherson, her sister Louisa Burt and Londoner Maria Rye. 
And I don't really want to make it sound here like they had pure evil intentions in doing this because I really don't think they did. I don't think they were thinking like, oh, let's be horrible people and send all these children abroad. I know a lot of us like to think things are very black and white, but the reality is a lot of history is very much in the gray. People are good and bad and reality doesn't exist in a vacuum. There are always external matters complicating things. It's very easy to look back on history with a 2023 lens and condemn every single little thing but it's not that simple. History sucks and I think it's very important to bear in mind that when judging things with today's knowledge, well you shouldn't. You shouldn't judge things by today's knowledge. History just sucks and I think it's important to bear that in mind when judging things with today's knowledge through 2023 rose tinted glasses. But it's easier to say that about things that happened in the 1860s. Less so when you consider that this only ended 60 years ago in the 1960s, but we'll get there. Annie McPherson was said to be utterly appalled by the conditions in which many children were living and working in this time in London, particularly in the matchbox industry. She writes at one point of a group of pale-faced little matchbox makers, a group of children all hidden away in an attic, spending every waking hour bent over pieces of wood, sanding them down into matchboxes. The youngest child is only three years old, working to earn just three farthings for 12 dozen matchboxes. A three-year-old working, it seems unimaginable, doesn't it? But it was the reality of Victorian Britain and many eras beforehand. It's still the reality in many places around the world. In 1869, it was found that out of the 3.9 million population of London, 154,000 people were relying on parish welfare relief. And many, many more were too proud to even come forward to request that help. Other estimates suggest there are as many as 30,000 children living rough on the streets of London. Victorian Britain, Victorian London was rough. The reasons behind this could be a whole episode in itself, but a huge part of it was down to the Industrial Revolution, which caused many families to migrate from rural areas to the big city, cutting off communication with their relatives in the countryside. Usually, when illness hits and parents die, if income was limited or children were simply abandoned, extended family would take on the care of surviving children. It was very much the mindset of it takes a village. But then many families moved to the city to find work and they lost this sort of extended family, this village they had. When parents died from one of the many deadly illnesses in this time in Victorian Britain, kids were simply left to fend for themselves, they had no one else. There were organisations out there to help, like Barnardo's or the Salvation Army, but it just often wasn't enough. So Annie was seeing all this and wanting to help, I suppose, but it wasn't entirely without agenda because she was an evangelical revivalist. She believed that mass human misery was the direct result of the devil's actions. Her writings describing the East End, Spitalfields, Bethnal Green and Whitechapel as the enemy's territory where Satan reigns openly. These evangelists believed that mass poverty was a forerunner to the apocalypse and they saw charity and philanthropy to be divine acts in order to prevent this. So, in February 1869, Annie buys a large warehouse on 60 Commercial Street in Spitalfields, and she turns it into the Beehive, otherwise known as the home of industry. This was a place to house, feed and educate the poor population of London, as well as provide employment opportunities. At any one time, the warehouse held up to 200 children, for a lot of them it really was a saving grace. 12-year-old Maggie Fritz was brought to the beehive after being kicked off the doorstep that she was sleeping on and Annie teaches her to become a housemaid. There was 10-year-old Punch who was found asleep in a barrel at Billingsgate Market alongside his dog. A boy called Hugh was one of four children with one on the way to a mother who just didn't earn enough money as a cigar maker to provide for them all and Annie took him in. At the beehive, Annie taught tailoring and shoe mending to the boys and sewing and domestic service to the girls. On Sundays after breakfast, she leads children to animal and bird fair at Club Row where they play and sing rousing hymns. The beehive was a success, children were taken off the streets, but Annie soon becomes convinced that the real solution to this problem was emigration, to send these children abroad to a country of opportunity and thus she begins an emigration fund. They were convinced that emigration was this brilliant solution, the kids would be housed, fed and clothed in exchange for work. 
The idea was that a small fee would be paid for fostering these young children, while slightly older kids would be expected to help with chores around the house, and adolescents could properly be put to work. At 18, these children could just be freed out into the wild. The clean, fresh air of Canada, nice, hearty, hard work, was seen as a wonderful alternative to the smog and pollution of the streets of London. But of course, that's not quite how it would work out. By the end of the 1860s, the Emigration Fund allows Maria Rye to arrive in Ontario, Canada with 68 children, with the blessing of the Archbishop of Canterbury. Rye had been facilitating and placing women consenting adults since 1867, and by the turn of the century, she will have settled 5,000 children, mostly girls, in Ontario. On the 12th of May 1870, Annie makes her own first journey to Canada with 100 boys, which will be the first of many. The children would be shipped to Liverpool where they would board ships, being subject to medical examinations on board. If they failed, they would be returned to shore. If they passed, off they went on the long and arduous journey across the Atlantic, suffering seasickness and all other kinds of sickness on the way. While some kids struggled on board the ship, others would say it was great fun. The crew took great care of them. The ships would either be destined for Halifax, Quebec City, Montreal or St John, where they would then be taken to distribution centres, these basically massive warehouses, before they'd then be picked off to go to their family homes. For that first group of 100 boys with Annie McPherson, Hastings County in Ontario provided rent for a distribution centre in Belleville, before the children were then sent to their receiving homes. Farmers or households basically had to provide an application for a child, and it's said that at its peak there are as many as seven applicants for every single child. So many families in Canada wanted these kids. One girl would later describe her experience of these distribution centres, saying that 12 boys and 12 girls were called inside a room where they had to line up on each side. There were four people in there who examined the children. The girl later said, The woman who was later my adopted mother came over to the little fair girl beside me and said, I like this one. My adopted father kept watching me. Every time I looked at him, he was smiling at me. He said to my mother, I like this little dark one and patted my head. So my mother said, well, I guess that's it. And that's all that was said. From here, children were mostly used as cheap labour, with no payment except room and boarding. They were forced to work long, hard hours, and in many cases received no love in return. Boys were often put to work on the farms, whilst girls would be given more sort of domestic duties in the home. And on top of this, kids were often separated from their siblings. They had literally no one to turn to. I cannot stress enough how traumatising this must have been for the children, being scooped up from the streets of London and stuck on a boat to start a new life in a country they've never visited, never heard of, without a single one of their loved ones, stripped away from the country and culture that they knew. Sure, many of them lived on the streets and they struggled, but that didn't necessarily make this life better or easier for them. But of course, as is the dichotomy of life, everyone had different experiences. According to who do you think you are magazine.com, one man looking back on his time on a farm in the early 1900s said, Those seven years were hell. I was beat up with pieces of harness, anything that came in handy. I herded cattle for five years, no horse, no dog, nothing to tell the time by. I had to have the cattle home by 5.30 in the afternoon. If I was late, I got beat up. My dinner was put in a £10 syrup pail. When it was time to eat it, it was dry as old toast. I never had a coat when it was raining, just a grain sack over my shoulders and no shoes. Whilst another man who was sent to Canada in 1894 said, Today I pay tribute to the memory of William Quarrier and my foster parents. They gave me shelter, food and care when I was adrift in poverty and despair. I thank him for the day when I first stepped on Canadian soil. I wish everyone's experience was like the latter, but of course it wasn't. A lot of the time the children wouldn't even have a chance to settle in their new homes, they were placed for set periods of time and regularly moved from family to family. There was zero stability in their lives. The charity was supposed to check in on a regular basis to ensure the children were being cared for, but they very, very rarely did. Farmers would either come to the receiving houses to pick up a kid, or the kids would just be sent off on their own with a cardboard sign around their neck to their destination. 
nation. Literally seven, eight, nine year old kids in a brand new country just being sent off with nothing more than a cardboard sign and the hope that one day they reach where they're supposed to. In the first year of operations, 500 children were sent to the Hastings County Centre and on the back of this success, Annie McPherson opened another receiving home in Galt, Ontario, while she persuaded her sister Louisa to open a third in Knolltown, which is 112 kilometres outside of Montreal. Meanwhile, her other sister Mary and her husband Joseph, incredible, acted as superintendents of the Home of Industry back in London, which is a position they held for several years until they later go to Gould and run the receiving home there. But of course, it wasn't long until rumours started to emerge about the abuse the children suffered at the hands of their new families. I mean, this was as soon as the early 1870s. There was also criticism of potential profiteering by the organisers of the schemes, particularly by Maria Rye. This was meant to be a charity organisation, they were meant to be helping, and now they're hugely profiting, whilst children are abused, some are dying, they're running away, they're going missing, it backfired hugely. So, in response, in 1874, the London Board of Governors deploy a representative, Andrew Doyle, to go and examine the homes and the children and provide a detailed report of how they live. When it's finished, his response condemns almost every single aspect of this emigration system. But this was very multi-layered. He said that insufficient checks were being made to ensure the children's welfare with their new families. Shocking. But he also said that he was shocked that children with good reputations from the workhouses were being grouped in with street children who he calls thieves and troublemakers. In his report, he writes, because of Miss Rye's carelessness and Miss McPherson's limited resources, thousands of British children already in painful circumstances were adrift to be overworked or mistreated by the settlers of early Canada who were generally honest but hard taskmasters. On the back of this report, the House of Commons of Canada does set up a select committee to examine these homes and despite the controversy, the scheme isn't stopped. Annie was said to have made some of the changes that were mentioned in the report, but as a whole the system just continues as normal, there simply just wasn't enough checks and balances in place to ensure that the changes recommended were made. The treatment of these kids was just unbelievably harsh. As I said before, they weren't treated like adopted children, but that was never the aim in the first place. These children are brought over to Canada to work, and that's what they were going to do. They were often stigmatised by their host families, they were called street rats or street workers, made to hide if anyone came around to visit. They were blamed for anything bad that happened in the household after their arrival, they became these sort of built-in scapegoats. As you can imagine, this led to a huge number of children feeling like they just had to stay silent about their treatment, otherwise it would just get worse. It was very much a whole catch-22 situation. Of course, this wasn't every single family. Some children were taken on as that, children forming close bonds with their parents, but that was the anomaly rather than the norm. In 1895, a young labourer was found to have died at an Ontario farm after only seven months of being in Canada. He was found emaciated, covered in sores and scars. He'd clearly had a terrible, terrible time and he died. And as if all of this wasn't already awful enough, more drama was happening back home as it began to transpire that many of these kids were never orphans at all. They had loving families who were waiting for their return. In this time, not knowing what else to do, many parents would turn their kids over temporarily to these institutions, institutions such as the Beehive. They weren't able to afford to care for them and this just seemed like a great opportunity for their kids to still be fed and cared for. In a lot of situations, it was a million times better than the alternative which was turning their kids out onto the streets. So now many of these parents are going back to the institutions, going back to the beehive to claim their children back, only to find they were gone, sent overseas forever. While some parents maybe did receive a week's notice about the fate of their children, many wouldn't find out at all until they had already gone, receiving an after sailing notice. Others would get absolutely nothing until they went to find them themselves. Not that anyone cared or listened to their cries because they were poor, it didn't really matter that their children were gone. But despite this, the home of industry was thriving and in 1887, a second one opens in Bethnal Green. More children coming in, right to be sent abroad. By the time Annie McPherson would die in 1904, she was responsible for exporting over 12,000 children from London to Canada and it didn't stop after her death. 
In 1909, a man called Kingsley Fairbridge funds the Society for the Furtherance of Child Emigration to the Colonies, which later just became the Fairbridge Foundation. Their intention was to educate orphaned and neglected children and train them in farming practices at schools all across the British Empire. Clearly, there was no intention to end this initiative anytime soon. But then, World War I happened. Great Britain now needed as many people and workers to remain in the country as possible, and they weren't about to waste resources transporting children across the Atlantic, plus German U-boats were waiting, so the practice basically stopped. But the war also gave many now adult home children in Canada the opportunity to come back to Britain. When Britain joined the war, Canada automatically did as well, being a part of the British Empire. Their international relations were very much controlled by Britain, so Canada didn't really have a choice, they were in the war. For many men, in fact the majority of male former home children saw this not only as their mother country needing their help, but also likely the only opportunity they would ever get to come back home and track down their families. They knew they'd be sent back to Britain for training for the war. For some who were still in abusive controlled homes, they saw this as their only chance of escape. Many would actually lie about their ages to enlist. Imagine being in such a terrible situation that war is preferable. More than 1,100 children would end up losing their lives in the trenches, and that was seen as the better end of the deal. The war ended in 1918, followed by the Spanish influenza pandemic just one year later, all of which caused a lot of death, meaning an incredible amount of children were now left without parents. There were more children on the streets of London than ever. Also, Canada had lost thousands of their farmhands when they went off to fight, and the ones that did return had lasting injuries, which meant they couldn't do the hard physical labour. So, of course, the practice picked up once again. We move on through the 1920s, where a spate of suicides are reported among home children. Imagine again how bad things have to be for children to resort to ending their own lives. It's unimaginable. This does lead to an eventual ban in 1924 on children under the age of 14 being taken to Canada, which was definitely something, but still, it wasn't great. During the Great Depression of the 1930s, there's another lull, as this is just an unnecessary expense. Britain can't afford to be sending the children, families in Canada can't afford to be taking on the children, so it stops for a bit, and then it starts up again, and then World War II starts up in 1939, and once again, the practice sees a significant decrease. Many of the children being brought over to Canada in the previous decade were again now of fighting age, so they went off to war once again. Numbers this time were estimated to be as high as 20,000 former home children joining the Canadian military. Now by this point Canada had a lot more control over their own laws. In 1926 Canada was confirmed as a self-governing dominion under the British Crown and then the Statue of Westminster in 1931 basically solidified this. But complete independence wouldn't be gained until 1982. But by the time World War II came around Canada had a lot more independence. It is a bit more complicated than that obviously but this episode is isn't about the history of Canada. It's not even entirely relevant. I just like sharing information. But anyway, after World War II, social consciousness made people condemn the act of sending children abroad a little bit more. And whilst it did continue on for a few more years, it definitely slowed down after this point. Between 1869 and 1939, it's estimated that 100,000 impoverished children were sent from Britain to Canada for a so-called better life. And whilst children stopped being sent to Canada around 1939, they continued being sent on to Australia until the 1970s. To put that into perspective, that could have been my parents if they found themselves in a bad situation as children. Maybe it was your parents. In my research for this episode, I found many sources stating that even as adults with families and lives of their own, many former home children would never share where they'd come from, what happened to them. The home children were often treated as vermin by their foster families. The shame was so great they would carry it as secret to their graves. Today it's estimated that 10%, that's 1 in 10 Canadians, are direct descendants of a British home child, but if you ask most people about it, they wouldn't have a clue, the shame of the home children being so great. I mean, the butterfly effect of this is absolutely huge. If it weren't for Annie McPherson, the whole state of the world could be entirely different today. Who knows what Canada as a country would look like today? As you can imagine, the aftermath of all this in the last few decades has been illuminating, a lot of stuff coming to light that had previously just been brushed under the rug. 
In 1987, Margaret Humphreys, a social worker from Britain, carried out an investigation that led to the exposure of this whole child migration scheme. People just really didn't know about it before, it wasn't really in the public consciousness, and she established the Child's Migrant Trust. She aims to reunite parents and children impacted by this migration practice and later released a book in 2010 called Empty Cradles, detailing the crimes and abuse suffered by thousands of children in this time. In 1998, a parliamentary inquiry in Britain found that many migrant children were subject to systematic abuse in religious schools in Australia, New Zealand and many other British colonies. Abuse in the name of religion? Shocking! Over the past couple of decades, information around this has been sort of permeating the British consciousness, with Prime Minister Gordon Brown making a speech in February 2010 apologising for the shameful programme, announcing a £6 million fund designed to compensate families who have been affected, saying that no injustice should last forever. It was a very small amount when you think about the 100,000 children, but it definitely it was something, £6 million, it was acknowledgement. In 2020, a report revealed that the Prince's Trust is providing funds to allow people forcefully emigrated specifically from Britain to Australia by the Fairbridge Society to make claims for compensation for physical and sexual abuse. But the Prince's Trust have also been criticised for covering its backside by initially denying any knowledge of the abuse. So what is it? No abuse or you're going to pay people for the abuse? I know we haven't really covered Australia in this video, that kind of is a subject for another day, but they did respond in kind. They've issued an informal apology to children who were transported over after having contacted over 400 British child migrants for advice on how such an apology should be delivered. In 2004, there has been a Forgotten Australians report concluding that abuse had taken place in the country and it concluded with many recommendations on how to proceed, including said apology. The Roman Catholic Church also had to issue a public apology. In November 2009, the former Prime Minister of Australia, Kevin Rudd, made a very heartfelt former apology. He said, we come together today to deal with an ugly chapter in our nation's history, to say to you, the forgotten Australians and those who were sent to our shores as children without your consent, that we are sorry. Sorry that as children you were taken from your families and placed in institutions where so often you were abused. A £1 million travel fund was also set up by the British government, later supplemented by the Australian government, in order to allow former child migrants to visit their families back in the UK. And whilst their modern day responses won't make up for what happened, it is something for the families, something for the victims. And I bring up Australia's response to this because it's kind of in stark contrast to Canada's response. Because Canada's response has been hugely criticised, with many people seeing parallels between their treatment of child migrants and their treatment of First Nations people. Basically a dismissal, let's sort of sweep it all under the rug and forget it happened. If we don't mention it, nobody's gonna know it happened. Canada has done some sort of little things, like in 1998 the Ontario Heritage Trust did erect a provincial historical plaque to honour the home children in Ottawa. The next year, in 1999, the federal government did designate the immigration of home children to be a national event, but that is about all they've done. Following the formal apologies from Britain and Australia in 2009, the Canadian Minister of Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship, Jason Kinney, responded quite differently. He said there was no need for the Canadian Council or Parliament to apologise, saying the issue has not been on the radar screen here, unlike Australia, where there's been a long-standing interest. The reality is that here in Canada, we are taking measures to recognise that sad period, but there is, I think, limited public interest and in official government apologies for everything that's ever been unfortunate or a tragic event in our history. However, surviving home children in Canada are obviously very disappointed by this, hoping the government would take some accountability for the way they were treated and left unchecked. Spokesman Sydney Baker says of the decision, I'm very disappointed. We've got 4 million Canadians who are descendants of home children and I think they deserve an apology for what their parents went through. He also notes they're seeking no compensation, just an acknowledgement, just an apology. That is all they want. 
2010 was proclaimed the year of the British Home Child by the Governor General of Canada and on September 1st of that year the Canada Post released a commemorative stamp, yes really, to honour those sent to Canada. In Ontario, the British Home Child Day Act of 2011 makes September 28th the British Home Child Day intended to recognise and honour the contributions of the British home children who established roots in Ontario. But like, that's it, that's all they've had. Canada's response to this in sort of direct juxtaposition with that of Australia and Britain is just, it's kind of baffling. I don't understand why they're unwilling to make an apology just to like settle the minds of the surviving home children, of the descendants of surviving home children. Like that's what they're asking for. They went through all this. Why not have at least that? I don't know why Canada is so unwilling to provide that. And that is the story of the British home children of Canada. I am so aware there are so many other avenues I could have gone down when exploring this topic. This is such a widespread thing to talk about. I, I really just didn't know where to begin, how to even approach this topic. So hopefully I've done a good enough job. I feel like I have done, but it's one of those things that's just so broad. It's really intimidating to try and talk about. Even if nothing else, hopefully that is just a general overview of the topic. Thank you so much for tuning in today and I will see you guys in the next one. Bye.